Welcome to Reaction with me, Ian Martin, editor of Reaction. Today we're talking to Bacha Unger Sargon about a fascinating subject, Bad News, um, her book, How Woke Media is Undermining Democracy. So, welcome. Thank you. Give us a bit of a sense about where the inspiration for this book um, <laughs> came from. What happened... Uh, in your, you know, in your in your career as a journalist, that altered your perspective on this uh, on this subject. So um, the way I think about it is, there are sort of three primal scenes that led to this uh, book's inception. The first was um, a Yale study from 2018 that found a big difference in how white liberals and white conservatives talk to people of color. They found that white liberals have a habit of dumbing down their speech when they talk to black and Latino people. They use uh, smaller words, fewer syllable words. Mm -hmm. And conservatives, white conservatives don't do this. And I remember reading that. Uh, I was very woke at the time and thinking to myself, and we call them the racists. Like there's something wrong with this picture that we literally are dumbing down our vocabulary on the assumption that any person of color that we meet is too stupid to understand big words. And we are calling them the racists. Now, it didn't happen all at once. I wish I could say the scales sort of fell from my eyes in that moment. It, they didn't. But I remember thinking to myself, file this away. There's something deeply unflattering about you and everybody you know. <laughs> in this study that, that bears um, paying attention to. I would say the second thing that really led to the book was <clears throat> learning about the deaths of despair and the strong correlation between communities with deaths of despair, meaning just the skyrocketing incidence of opioid overdose, alcoholism, and suicide in rural America uh, among Americans without a college degree. Learning about the strong correlation between communities with deaths of despair and voting for Donald Trump and then turning on CNN, turning on MSNBC and seeing the contempt with which my class, the educated chattering class spoke about these people who were literally killing themselves out of despair. And that kind of sneering and smearing of them as racists and as rubes who were sort of unworthy of our concern, it just didn't sit right given what I was learning about just the downward mobility in this country. Um, that is really shocking for a country like America that doesn't have a history of that, has a history of the opposite of sort of raising people up. And the third thing that happened was I wanted to write another book and I couldn't sell it. And that book was, uh, I was spending a lot of time in the South during the Trump years, um, talking to Trump voters, hundreds of Trump voters, um, people of color, white people, communities where they were living side by side, communities where they were praying side by side. Um, and I, I wanted to write a book about how we're just a lot less divided than we think, how mm -hmm. there had been seismic shift on the right over the last 20 years around issues of identity and all of the issues that used to be culture wars for the left had been won essentially by the left. And we just didn't know it. Nobody wanted to talk about how unified we finally are as a nation around the values that this great nation was founded on. And I wanted to write a book called A More Perfect Union about this. And I just couldn't sell it. I couldn't get a single editor to green light this project because they kept saying to me, there's no market for it. And I was like, everyone is the market for this. Um, finally, a very kind editor sat me down and said to me, well, if we're not polarized, if we're not divided, why do we think we are? Maybe you should write that book. And I think that that is the book that I wrote. So those are the sort of three mm. primal scenes that led to bad news. That's, that really is extraordinary in its way, though, isn't it? This, this, this idea was impossible to yeah. sell. <laughs> was that just because it was really, if you like, counter countercultural? Um, people, I mean, it's people, I don't people, people want to hear the story that they yeah. believe about um, about division. It, it wasn't a perfect proposal. I don't want to be like I had this perfect. You know what I mean? It could be that it was just, you know, it was not, you know, a perfect proposal. I can see now the ways in which I would write it slightly differently. But yeah, they kept saying to me, there's no market for a book about pol that were not polarized because the way that book publishing works now is you have conservative publishers and you have liberal publishers and each of them is banking on their audience, like the most extreme people on their side to buy these books. And so the books are being funneled 
to those extremities. And if they can't picture, you know, that sort of silent majority that I'm describing as a book buying uh, uh, cohort, then they will not green light the project. And I was very, very depressed for a while. And then the pandemic started, there was literally nothing else to do. So I picked myself back up and I, I wrote a different book. <laughs> so this is, uh, so this is a book, which is, of course, is about the US, but some of these trends are observable elsewhere and we'll you know we'll come we'll come on to that and america is so culturally influential and maybe even more influential than it's ever been because of what's happened with the with the internet so there mm -hmm. there there are lessons for the rest of us to to learn but it's primarily about what's happened to american journalism and you you work on the opinion desk on um, a great american uh, famous old american title newsweek what how would you characterize what has happened to uh, to American journalism? You you describe it as becoming a preoccupation or an occupation dominated by elites. How has this come about? So over the course of the twentieth century, journalism underwent a status revolution in America. It used to be a working class trade. So in 1937, a survey of America's elite journalists, the Washington cohort found that less than half of them had a college degree and some of them had not even gone to high school. It was a job that you picked up by doing it, you know, which mm. makes sense. You can't really teach journalism. I mean, you can't really teach someone to be a good listener, to question their biases. I mean, you're supposed to be able to teach that, but we know for certain that American universities are not teaching that anymore. Um, and, and, and so it was the kind of job, it didn't pay very well. So you would have journalists living next door to plumbers, you know, electricians, and not making that much more than them. It was a working class trade, you know, they would live next to cops, they would live next to teachers, and they would, you know, all of these people were, were, were working class. What happened over the course of the 20th century was a status revolution to where in 2015, when they did a similar survey to find out what percentage of American journalists had a college degree, the number was now 92%. Now, bear in mind, only 36% of Americans have a college degree. And it's not just that they're hi more highly educated, one of the most highly educated industries in America. They are much more affluent. The American economy right now over the last 20 years has simply been working extremely well for highly educated Americans meritocratic elites working in knowledge industry jobs. And it's been working very poorly for the working class and the downwardly mobile middle class leading to these deaths of despair. And I argue that you know, the media's sort of great awakening, the obsession with race and gender and issues of identity is really masking the status revolution that catapulted journalists into the elites. You know, when you're working class, when you live among people who work in factories, who work as cops, your life looks like their life. And so you are covering issues from being embedded in these communities. Today, 75% of journalists live on the coasts. They are in the top 10% in terms of income. Come. And a survey from 2015 found that not only do they live in blue states and blue districts, but if you are a working journalist in America today, you are likely to live in some of the most blue districts that went for Clinton by the most amount of numbers. I'm sorry, this is from 2017 mm. from, from Politico. So journalists are now increasingly sequestered from other Americans. They're much more far left, but not on issues of economics. So what's interesting is that what the Trump phenomenon really revealed was that there is a hunger for economic populism among working class conservatives. And I think Brexit has a very similar valence to it. Um, you see now people who vote Republican who also are voting for a $15 minimum wage or who voted for Trump the second time because of his very protectionist economic policies, many of which were things that Bernie Sanders was advocating for in 2015. Um, and, and, and so as the right has become more economically populist, there's this irony to the fact that the left has become, you know, what Thomas Piketty calls a Brahmin left. It has become very dissociated from the economic realities of labor, though it's for, you know, what used to be its base, and is now catering to a highly educated liberal elite with 
platform agenda items like forgiving $50,000 in student loans, right? Like who is that for? <laughs> you can't imagine a Democrat from the 70s advocating something like that, something that's clearly going to benefit accountants and dentists, and that's going to be paid for by plumbers and electricians. And I argue that all of this, the embrace of woke language, highly specialized academic language around race is really a smokescreen for a huge class chasm in America that has benefited the intelligentsia, including including journalists. Now, so you're very um, robust about the New York Times. Um, <laughs> it, does it does it does it symbolise? Is it a manifestation, the, the best manifestation of the trends that you're talking about? Because it, it's also, as as a journalist, it's and I've described the, um, the the New York Times only partly satirically as the world's worst uh, newspaper. I mean, it's always been kind of <laughs> annoying, um, but did also some you know some great journalism down the down the years. But it's very successful mm. on one level at the moment, mm -hmm. isn't it? I mean, it's to look at its digital subscriptions. It has a huge audience also outside the U.S. What is it that you dislike about the New York Times? Um, what's what's your issue with it? So my book begins in the 19th century uh, with the origin story of American journalism, which was actually, uh, it started as a populist revolution. You had people like Joseph Pulitzer, who showed up on a scene where um, there were really, you know, a lot of papers for the elites and not a lot of papers for the working class. Mm. And he realized that there were just so many poor and working class Americans that if you created something for them, you know, the penny press and charge them just a penny for it, you'd sell a lot of copies. And he got very, very rich doing this. But crucially, he didn't want to wage a crusade on their behalf. He wanted them to be consumers. Like he want, it wasn't like a charity project. Mm -hmm. He the, those papers, the Penny Press was created by and for working class Americans, and it was very much about turning them into subjects, turning the public into an idea, an unignorable idea because of how many people were represented by it. And the paper, the Penny Press really made them unignorable. Now, the New York Times, uh, it actually its origin story is in a counter revolution to the Penny Press's revolution. The Times showed up on the scene, and um, it's it's it you know Henry Raymond Jarvis, who was his the um, originator of the of the New York Times. He realized that he couldn't compete with the penny presses for numbers, right? They had a lock on the numbers because obviously there's so many more poor and working class people than there are rich people. What he realized was if he could do the opposite, if he could somehow create an exclusive product and then convince advertisers that only the elites were reading his paper, he could charge more for ads, right? Because think about it, if you have an ad in a newspaper for a $10,000 watch, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, 95% of your paper is poor and 5% is rich, right? So, you know, you have you, that, that ad will be, you know, relevant to 5% of your readers. If you have an ad for a $10,000 watch and 95% of your readership is in the market for a $10,000 watch because they're elites and you can tell this to the advertiser, that ad suddenly becomes a lot more valuable, right? Because it's not being wasted on the eyeballs, of the poor and the working classes. That is the model that the New York Times sort of coalesced around as it showed up to create exclusive content for a more exclusive audience. Now they weren't only catering to the rich, they were catering also to the aspirational, right? The aspirational rich to a rising middle class that was increasingly seeing itself and its fortunes as part of the elites. But it was very much based on that model of exclusion. And in fact, when Joseph Pulitzer's heirs tried to give away to the New York Times for free circulation of the world in 1931, the New York Times turned it down because they didn't want those readers even as a gift because they would actually lower the value of their ads, right? So you had these two models, the populist model and then the more exclusive model, and the populist model is just gone. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. right-wing media does cater more to the working class, but they don't cater to their work to their interests from an economic point of view. 
Like all they have to do is not insult their values and they have a lock on that <laughs> entire community, but they don't actually represent their economic interests. Let's be real here, right? This whole trickle down nonsense is just, they're able to smuggle that in and unite conservative, rich conservatives with poor and working class conservatives because there's no competition. So the story of the 20th century is just the story of the abandonment of the working class by the liberal media, the New York Times model taking over. Now that brings us to digital media. Now let's talk about what happened most recently. So the New York Times Times actually struggled at first to become, um, you know, to be competitive in the digital market. 2014 was a really bad year for the New York Times. And in order to figure out what went wrong, the son of the publisher, who is now the publisher, A.G. Salzberger, came up with this innovation report that was leaked to the press, so we know what was in it. And in it, he blamed um, two main problems for why the Times was failing digitally. And in these two issues, you see exactly, basically foreshadowed everything that's going to happen over the next, you know, five, six years at the New York Times. The first thing that the, the innovation report was very adamant about was the child Chinese wall separating the business side of the times from the journalism editorial side had to come down. Now, obviously, that dividing line has been a sacred tenet of journalism, yeah. right? That he wanted, he, you know, there's a line in this report that says it is the job of the newsroom to grow the audience. He very much felt that journalists' job was audience, which is a business concern, right? Which is about how you, you make that revenue. He wanted to see journalists thinking about audience, thinking about how to grow to audience, thinking about how to be more compelling to more readers. Now, on the one hand, that's okay. But the methods whereby they sort of settled on really, really did tear down that crucial dividing line, especially when, you know, the model was less going to be less focused on ads and more focused on subscribers, because what it meant was he wanted to see a back and forth between subscribers and journalists. He wanted journalists to be very aware of what their readers were coming to them for and not to upset those readers and not to upset those subscribers, but to give them more and more of they wanted, what they wanted. The second thing he, he wanted was to see his individual journalists becoming social media stars. There's this really funny line in the innovation report where <laughs> its authors are horrified to learn about a journalist who didn't tweet about his story for two whole days, you know, the horror of it all, right? You know, they wanted them out there creating these, you know, big waves on social media because that drives a lot of traffic. And so what they ended up doing was A, create a situation where everyone at the New York Times, all the journalists understand their job as being beholden, not to the truth, but to their subscriber base. And number two, journalists out there with a lot of public social media power, which we have seen again and again, the New York Times' own journalists wielding their immense social media power against their own colleagues, which then the New York Times' brass, upper brass, will use as an excuse for actual personnel decisions and actual coverage decisions. So the New York Times essentially, through the digital media model, has outsourced both moral and journalistic authority to Twitter, to its subscribers, to what its readers want to see. And there's a lot of examples about this and about how it's influenced the actual coverage. But I'll just give you one. Mm. So Musa Al-Garbi, who's like a, a brilliant sociologist, he counted the number of times Donald Trump's name appeared in the New York Times in 2017. Uh, he trawled the sort of the back end. Um, there's, he created a software to do this. And he found that Donald Trump's name was mentioned 97,000 times, which is the equivalent of every 250 words, okay? Now, lest you think, okay, he's a first year president, like that's normal, you know, President Barack Obama in his first year in office, his name only appeared 37,000 times. That, that is a staggering difference. So why is Donald Trump's name there every 250 words? It's the same reason that the New York Times right now is obsessed with race, is knee deep in a moral panic around race because it is based on trying to create loyal readers and subscribers out of highly affluent white liberals. And it is based on doing that through emotion. And the more, because the more emotional they are, the more engaged they are. And the more engaged they are, the more more money the, the paper is making. And 
two things make affluent white liberals very emotional. <laughs> it's Donald Trump and the idea that they themselves are white supremacists. So you can really see in the sort of the shift to digital media, how the New York Times took what was its model, which is catering to an elite, right? Catering yeah. to their tastes through expensive content and how today that is reflected in this highly emotive coverage. And it's, it's like a, a feedback loop, is it? Mm, Where absolutely. the audience wants more of what it wants and the journalists share those values do you think because they're they have elite educations in common and a completely a common uh, a common um, world view and is very interested in what you said earlier about the class uh, connotations of this because if i think back to when um, i started in newspapers sort of more than 25 years ago in that world, it was not just, I mean, you describe journalists being drawn from the community and living along, uh, living more working class lives. But even in the UK, even if, even if that wasn't always the case, they were themselves much more, I use the word diverse in the, in the content, in, in class terms, mm -hmm. in that you had, you had contact between the printers and the ad sales people and the people who ran the, the building and the journalists themselves. And the journalists themselves tended to be drawn not just uh, from universities, uh, from people with a university background. They had very often started on local newspapers, something we've come to in a, in a moment, mm -hmm. which is a global story, just the, mm -hmm. the death of and disappearance of local newspapers. So the newspaper itself, the newspaper office environment, the canteen, the daily interactions, the meetings, were much less exclusive in class in uh, in class terms presumably the new york times once you take things like printing out of the equation and you live purely digitally and you're working along alongside people who who believe broadly the same things uh, you can understand how this echo chamber just carries on getting worse and worse absolutely and in america of course race is an issue so our newsrooms are very 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 white they have been yeah. very, very, I mean, for a long time, black people could not get jobs in journalism. And then, you know, they would get jobs if there would be a riot and, you know, the white journalists didn't want to go and cover it. And so they would hire, you know, a, a black journalist to do that. You know, obviously this was terrible. Um, our, our newsrooms remain very, very white because of course, America's elites and America's rich people are very, very white. And you have to be rich to become a journalist today. I mean, obviously there are a few exceptions, you know, the, you know, the, a few working class people managed to, to slip by, but by and large to become a journalist in America today, you have to come from money. You have to be able to take an unpaid internship in New York City for three months. Okay, done, right? Like <laughs> you already knocked off like, you know, 95% of Americans who can't afford to do that. So that's why they remain very, very white. Now, one of the areas that has diversified at the New York Times specifically was exactly like you said. So of course we they need fewer and fewer truck drivers and printers, right? And working class people at, in ancillary jobs to the journalism. But what they need is more and more people who to do production, to do podcasting, to do video, to do social media. And they have been very, uh, I think, in a good way, done a very concerted effort to, to hire diverse people for these jobs. Mm -hmm. But essentially, they hire them all from elite institutions. I mean, like, why not, right? These jobs are very, very in demand. We know that the New York Times takes its in the vast majority of its interns from the top 1% of universities. And a lot of these other jobs are by people who are, it is, you know, the elites of minority groups who have managed to get this same very elite education. And so they come in with these very, very far left views on race that do not reflect the communities that they come from at all. They do not reflect the black community. They do not reflect, reflect the Latino community, which are very conservative communities by and large, very religious communities by and large. Irrespective of who they vote for, the working class in America is extremely conservative. Um, and so, but these, these, these kids go to Harvard, right? And so they're coming in, you know, as a video production person to the New York Times from Harvard with these very far left views on race. And because the you know Gen Xers and mo older millennials and boomers at the New York Times don't know any people of color. They assume that these views represent you know these communities, and they allow themselves to be browbeaten very publicly into submission by you know 
you know, letter writing campaigns to fire this one and, you know, letter writing campaigns that, you know, we all feel endangered by this op-ed, right? It's very much a class story. Mm -hmm. um, and it really, the, the, it's really terrible to see this at the New York Times because there's that downstreaming effect. Well, if this is happening at the New York Times, like, you know, it, it just, the impact it has on the rest of the journalism world cannot be overstated, especially because of how financially successful the New York Times has been at this, at mm -hmm. abdicating a lot of its journalistic integrity. What about journalism at a, at a local level, what we would call local newspapers, but you think back to American journalism 40, 50 years ago, big uh, or even relatively small cities had thriving journalistic scenes yeah. and very healthy local newspapers was it the same as it was in the uk where um what we called fleet streets the center of the uk <laughs> industry was was driven primarily there were graduates but the main sort of power um lay with very often lay with people who'd come up through the local and regional route may not have been university educated but acquired extraordinary production skills that the people that actually made the newspapers happen and were very often autodidacts intellectually and could um and, and 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 knew how knew how to how to talk to to graduates and teach them a lesson and teach them how the world works but the the destruction of that news ecosystem is that is it similar in the u.s with absolutely it's papers? identical yeah you would have, you know, for you would have a lot of towns actually in America that were one paper towns, right? Mm -hmm. And you would have Republicans and Democrats living in this town. So the publisher could either skew right or skew left and lose 50% of the town's residents, or he could force his journalists like, you know, hew to the center, we can get everybody, right? And so you had that. But again, to me, it, that's very much a class story as well. Like we, we talk about like the golden age of Walter Cronkite, right? Where he could speak to, to right and left at the same time. That's not what made him unique. What made him able to speak to left and right was that he was speaking to the working class, the middle class, and the upper class. And that because America was much more upwardly mobile, and because there was much less class stratification, people could get their news from the same place. And now we're just seeing this great sorting where, ironically, the Republicans who have always been the party of the rich are the only people who can speak to working class Americans. And the Democrats who are supposed to be the party of labor are the ones who are only speaking for the highly educated what can you do about this? I mean, <laughs> in terms of getting at the, you're watching um, Reaction, I should say to the viewers, if you're not a subscriber to Reaction, click the subscribe button below. And uh, you can also visit the site and uh, sign up and become you know, become a member of Reaction. You get my weekly newsletter on politics and all, all of the other writing from the team. But that's something that we're, we're one of the things one of the reasons we founded Reaction five years ago was partly out of this concern about what's happening to in, in our small way. Could we could we provide a place where um, where young journalists who want to get into the industry could could learn mm -hmm. as they developed, and many of them have then you know gone off to other um, uh, other parts of the industry. So we've been very concerned with this. What do you? do i mean is it is it about small initiatives like that or is there is there something that can be done in terms of ta of tackling big tech because i mean the, the the thing underpinning the entire story is simultaneously big tech's destruction of or um assault on the the old-fashioned uh, newspaper industry and it's effectively replaced it and destroyed the economic model what, what on earth can you do well, this is not going to be very satisfying, I don't think, but <laughs> well, I'm religious and I feel like the most important thing you can do is like um, be better to your fellow American or your your fellow Brit and not engage in the sneering and smearing of people who disagree with you. You know, every time you're online and you feel that, you know, that feeling, it feels like road rage, like oh, I can't believe somebody has this wrong opinion on the internet. I have to kill them or at least write an eviscerating tweet about how racist they are. You know, that feeling, we all have it like that. Like you see something someone says on the internet and you feel like enraged. That every time you feel, it's not natural to feel that way about a stranger. Like when you feel that way, someone's making a million dollars. You know, every time you feel that way, that's just putting money in the pockets of big tech, 
a politician, some media company. Mm -hmm. And like, we are 100% the only people who can stop ourselves from feeling that way. And uh, in America right now, there's actually just a slow consumer boycott of the news. So people just don't trust it anymore. They're not interested in it, but I think that's a good thing. Like, I I think that we've replaced spirituality and community and caring about each other with knowing things. I mean, it's all part of that, like meritocratic elite. We're obsessed with education. We're obsessed with knowledge that means nothing and matters to nobody about the news and I just I think you know I don't know why we have to know everything (laughs) it's a weird thing for a journalist to say but you know like honestly like if if each of us would just treat each other with respect we would be solving this problem so much more like you know capitalism exists and it's not who like the New York Times not going to say no to making millions and millions of dollars from you know affluent liberals who now have the chance to call anyone who disagrees with the economic platform that puts the most money in their pockets racist right like no who's gonna i don't see that getting disrupted anytime soon but um we can stop we can stop perpetuating it you know each of us every single day (laughs) it's a a good point but it it is tough because well we've all felt that feeling seeing someone who's an opponent as we term it get something wrong and wanting to correct it or point it or, or point it out but something it's it's connected to the it's facilitated by the technology isn't it because in the olden days by which i mean about 25 30 years ago if you felt that about an op-ed in the newspaper in the wall street journal or the new york times or your local newspaper uh you you felt maybe the same sense of rage but to communicate it you had to go to your kitchen table, get out a piece of writing paper, sit down, try and draft it, find find the address for the newspaper. Your rage is probably subsiding by that point. <laughs> Put it down on, on 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 that piece of paper. And then you go and make yourself a coffee and you come back and think, Well, that sounds a bit that sounds a bit crazy, doesn't it? Let's try and try a second draft to make it sound a bit more polite. Now, in one case in a thousand, that's gonna produce a beautiful letter, which is the lead letter in the you know the times of london or the wall street journal or any of the great great papers um but you then also there's another test or there's another kind of barrier to rage which is that you've got to walk to the post box and you've got to post it and then it might not get in it might just get put straight in the bin or or certainly be read at the newspaper so that process is a is a civilizing process which which steers people in the direction of uh, of better manners not everyone because we used to get you know we used to get hundreds and hundreds of um, letters well not hundreds but you'd get a portion of letters which were really really um, angry and wouldn't get wouldn't get published but there was a, a system there and a natural human defense thing mm-hmm. Bruno Bruno um, Massayas wrote a really interesting piece the other day about the metaverse and said actually it's not a case of is it is it coming this is the the, the dreadful sort of 3d 4d world whatever that um, mark zuckerberg and nick clegg want us to live in permanently being advertised and monetized by facebook the next phase of the internet as bruno said isn't it already here isn't that what twitter already is a sort of permanent non-stop rolling conversation you're in it virtually and you feel that you're engaged and you're engaging with your critics and everyone's shouting and it's noisy and it is uh, and it's and it, but it's you you talked about um news boycotts there i mean it's it's difficult to i it's difficult to see people stopping isn't it now that this thing now that this process has started i mean in the elites yeah but um i think when you go to mixed income neighborhoods working class neighborhoods immigrant neighborhoods there's just a lot less of this and um we who set the agenda just don't we increasingly spend time with each other you know (laughs) um so i think that you know a a healthy dose of you know skepticism about the doomsday reports is is good because they sort of come from what ails us which is um thinking we're too important (laughs) good point but do i mean do you do you see a way to and what one you know good aspect of all of this is that gratifyingly people still do want to become journalists it's not as though despite what tech has done and the the anger there are still lots of idealistic 
um, kids, and you, you might say that they're in the U.S. They're 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 drawn you know they're drawn from a certain strand of the of the elite, but people still believe that journalism matters. Is there anything that can be done beyond you were talking there about behavior online? But in terms of training journalists or in or, or try you know, just trying to to help people from non elite backgrounds become journalists, what on earth can be done? Yeah, I mean, we journalists really do need to elevate the voices of working class Americans and make them, you know, force force the intelligentsia to acknowledge and admit that they exist and bring them as much as we can into our midst. Um, I feel like increased, I, I, I can't remember the last time I really felt like there was going to be some kind of social shift in the makeup of journalists. But what we're seeing instead actually is... Um, I mean, I don't know if it's like this in the UK, but in America, it really is only conservative um, outlets that are catering to the working class. But what that's done is it's had a bizarre moderating effect on Fox News. I, I, like sometime around 2018, 2019, I think it realized that it had an opportunity to get a lot of independence. And the news coverage became much more staid, the daytime. Obviously, the nighttime is still crazy. Um, and I think that that is very interesting, especially given, um, you know, the increasing popular economic populism among right wing conservatives. I mean, I do think that there is an opportunity for some kind of realignment, some kind of left right populist realignment. And if that does happen on the political scene, I think that could have an impact on journalism. I mean, even last week. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say like, a lot, so we had this, um, this election in Virginia, um, mm. where um, basically, <laughs> the Democrats lost big because of a lot of the kind of, because of their insistence on talking about things in a way that's alienating to working class Americans of all races, essentially. But there were, you know, CNN really did spend the week kind of genuflecting about this and saying, are we part of the problem? <laughs> like, why is this messaging not landing? Maybe it's time for us to sort of shift. And, and, and I mean, that was shocking. I don't know if that means anything. I don't know if it's, but it was very surprising because of course MSNBC leaned all the way in and was like the only people who voted for Glenn Youngkin are white supremacists, right? So that I thought that was really surprising and interesting and gave me hope. Yeah, because that, that election did get a lot of, coverage and a lot of uh, yeah. attention in the UK and, and elsewhere because consider the, the problems that the Republican Party has at the moment. It, it, if you were taking, pl placing a bet at the moment, you'd say that Donald Trump is probably going to be its, uh, you know, going to be its, uh, going to be the party's nominee despite everything that happened in, um, you know, around inauguration time. And uh, he seems to still have a grip on the party in terms of um, what candidates and um, office bearers are prepared to say, even in those circumstances, with the Republicans theoretically in, in, in trouble, something didn't work for the Democrats. I did see people say, well, I saw very, several pollsters over here say, well, this can't be really about critical race theory, because most voters don't really <laughs> know what that is or don't pay that much att attention to it and i would dis dispute that it's difficult i feel not having been to the us because of what's been going on for the last couple of years i feel like i feel reluctant to, re reluctant to comment until i uh, do visit next time but it does seem to be whether it's crt specifically or whether it's a br that that is shorthand or just part of mm -hmm. a wider set of issues and attitudes is it to do with middle ground voters, um, working class voters and middle class voters, just seeing the Democrats as being off on a sort of wacky journey, um, completely divorced from their reality? So Youngkin won, as far as I can tell, for three reasons. The first reason people gave was the economy. And it's so funny, you'll hear like... <laughs> far left journalists being like, literally say, I've heard so many of them say this, voters don't understand inflation. And so conservative news talks to them about culture war issues and gins up support, you know, based on that stuff. And it's like, 
voters understand inflation. Like they understand you're if you're rich, you don't understand inflation because you don't care if your bought your gallon of milk costs 365 or 765. If you're poor or working class or even middle class, you understand inflation every time you go to the supermarket. It's just classic elitism. It is so it's it baked into every their analysis of everything. Like, voters don't understand inflation. Are you kidding me? That's the first reason the economy is terrible right now. There's a labor crisis. There's a supply chain crisis. People can't get things. Bread is expensive. You know, they're going to vote against the, the ruling party when, you know, when, when bread gets expensive, like that just makes perfect sense. And it's just such an own goal for, for liberals to be like, no, that is, that's racist, you know, like to be like, and they did the exact same thing with Trump. It, they said, you know, their, you know, economic anxiety is a dog whistle for racism. That is what they said over and over about people who were saying I'm voting for Trump because of economic, you know, I'm, I feel anxious mm. about, about the economy. Um, the second reason that they voted for him, for Glenn Youngkin was because of it wasn't just critical race theory. It was a host of school related issues. It was the closures. It was the masking. It was the mixed signals about children getting the vaccine. It was the general sense of parents having spent two, you know, two years in the presence of their children because of lockdowns. Also, so getting a lot of information about what their kids are doing, what they're, and, 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 having all these mixed messages and Terry McAuliffe literally saying to parents who had just spent, you know, all this time with their kids, you have no say in what's going to be taught. I mean, he came out and said that during a debate. That was obviously an unforced error. And the third thing, critical race theory, I agree with you that I think it doesn't, it's not that, you know, when parents are sort of voting on critical race theory, they're not voting on the sort of legal analysis that came out of, you know, Harvard in the seventies, they're voting against, the feeling that they should be ashamed of America and ashamed of themselves. But again, the liberal media's response to this is so such a perfect example of classism and contempt for the lower classes masquerading as a social justice war on behalf of people of color, right? They don't sit there and say, let's figure out what these parents are trying to communicate and make sure that there's room for us in the Democratic Party. What they say is they don't know what critical race theory is. That's not a political statement. That's a class statement. They're saying they're not educated enough to know what this thing is. Ergo, they must have been hypnotized by conservative media who's, you know, creating this big culture war. That's a class statement. And I think over and over you saw this. You saw people using like this sort of this disparity in education and using race as an excuse to express contempt for people who are not as educated as they are. that That's kind of the, that's what I wrote. The book begins, my book begins with a scene like that, using the real pain of black Americans, the real ways in which America continues to fail black Americans, white liberal elites who are very affluent now use that in order to justify and express their contempt for the working class of all races, by the way, and to further dispossess them and kick them out of the public, the public square. The question of universities, because it, it, if your contention is that newsrooms of these giant titles like the New York Times are dominated increasingly by mm -hmm. journalists who have this this worldview, what has been? Um, we have some of similar debates in in the UK, but not not identical. What has been going on in American universities over the, the course of the last twenty or thirty years to produce? this dominant worldview well i okay so i would say it, it makes sense to me that it wouldn't be as extreme in the uk because um you guys don't have the kind of income inequality we have and, and essentially my argument is that it's it's a it's a smokescreen for income inequality so it, i struggle to see how it would hit i could see it seeping in because of the outsized in, impact american culture has but i wouldn't i wouldn't worry too much <laughs> Unless you guys start, you know, having billionaires and, and very poor people and like, you know, very little in between. Um, we're, ca we're catching up. <laughs> yeah. So so the, the pickety argument would be that it's not about income. It's about class and education. And to mm. the extent that you guys do have that same kind of where where the elites are increasingly on this, you know, their their focus is increasingly on things like environmentalism and the working class, their focus is increasingly on immigration, you know, that it's really that divide that's that's driving, you know, my think, book would yeah. predict. Yeah, I think, I, I think it was in the UK. I think it is a 
I think so much of this stuff flows from the financial crisis, maybe in the US mm -hmm, as well, mm -hmm. where um, and maybe we're seeing it again with environmentalism. I'm not not, mm -hmm. not sure in that the story up to 2008, and I've said this a lot, but the, the, the story that the elite elites and some you know, parts of that are conservative elite and parts of that are um, you know, center left in terms of Blair, et cetera, in the UK. Mm -hmm. The story is, listen, you don't really need to worry about economics because economics is something which is now settled. We've settled mm -hmm. this at a level mm -hmm. almost above the nation state, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we, we have a global, globalized economic system. Free trade will create you know, ever better value mm -hmm. and ever cheaper goods and more growth and um, you just you just need to keep on consuming. Don't worry about it. Anyone who mentions any of the potential downsides in terms of factories closing or the world changing at at a, at a pace that that voters find uh, in working class communities find um, upsetting can be dismissed as the people just being anti progress and mm -hmm. even you know in certain cases racist. So that's the story that persists until you get to the financial crisis. Because in the financial crisis, the, that story of you don't need to worry about economics, this happens at a globalized multinational level and the smart people have got all this figured out. Then when it all goes wrong and the bill lands, the bill lands with the nation state and the national taxpayer. So I think voters learned some really hard tough lessons about how the world really works and the flaws of globalization in 2008 and that to me ultimately is what brexit is about which is not i think fair to say it's not working out it's not working out brilliantly so far but it was a rejection of that yeah. globalized elites arrogance if you like the kind of arrogance of davos man saying you can't have any concerns about immigration mm -hmm. just suck it up because we know what's uh, best globalization is the is the future and that must be a, that must be a factor in what's happened in u.s politics as well absolutely yeah yeah I, yeah but do you so do you see any um any can kind of way through this i mean you talked about how let's take the new york times new york times is dominant it's making so much money it's not going to stop doing this but has are there signs of hope do you think um, journalistically elsewhere is there anything you, you think that's happening the, the sort of the rise of the Substack movement, smaller publishing outfits. Some people are trying to are trying to fight back. You know, I in the book I make the argument that a polarized or partisan media is not a problem as long as everybody has someone representing them. So you know, the Penny Press that I sort of um, idolized, the populist press. It was very partisan, you know, and mm -hmm. and we can think of these sort of golden ages of journalism in America where, you know, for example, in the 20s, there were so many communist newspapers that you could be a communist and have four communist newspapers that you would never dream of opening because they were so wrong about communism, you know, like there was just a lot of competition and a lot of partisanship. There was the idea of a sort of objective press didn't really exist. Different papers would check each other's nonsense, but there was no sense of, you know, that you had to sort of represent all sides. And I think, you know, what happened in um, another golden age, you know, the post-war era, um, golden in some ways, obviously we were still struggling with segregation and, and equality for black Americans, but um, that th a time of great economic mobility for working class Americans, um, there was this sort of sense of, you know, th the sense of objective media really flourished because people were able to read similar things, even if they disagreed because of all of the mobility. And what that meant was people didn't really mind seeing opposing views in their papers. In fact, they wanted to, that was considered to be a sign mm. of, um, you know, cosmopolitanism, let's say, you know, and um, what we have now is like an increasingly splintered media. But the problem is, is like all conservative media is catering basically to the top 5% of conservatives and all liberal media is catering to the top 10% of liberals and nobody's talking to 90 95% of Americans, at least in what I would like to see, which is, um, you know, supporting labor from an economic point of view, uh, a really robust view of what a pro labor uh, economic agenda would be that's not 
you know, the welfare state of the left or the trickle down of the right, but is something that really focuses on bolstering the dignity of working class Americans and making sure that they're woven back into the fabric of American society from which they've been excised. Um, so the, to me, the problem is more that there are a lot of Americans who, ha you know, really are being shunted to uh, much more marginal outlets because, you know, the mainstream is not speaking to them and is speaking over them or is calling them racist. So mm. CNN, for example, lost a huge chunk of its working class audience over the last 10 years with the Great Awakening. So as it has, you know, com started to use more and more of these concepts from academia, you know, 20% of its working class viewership just stopped showing up. Uh, that, that should be a real crisis for, but of course it's not because those are not the viewers that they want. They want the highly educated ones, you know? Yeah. Um, so to me, the real problem is that the working class doesn't have a press advocating for it. But when I think about like how much of a problem is that, you know, there right now we're, we're seeing a kind of worker revolution in America. You're seeing a lot of workers standing up and saying no at John Deere, at Kellogg's. There are big um, strikes, some of them union organized, some of them not. And these strikes are made up of Democrats and Republicans. They, you know, work, the working class just doesn't care. They're not like the elites because they don't make money off of being politically polarized, you know? They're standing together and they're standing up for their rights. They're doing that even though the media is ignoring them. So it's like- Is, do, uh, do, but is, is the New York Times not also, a paper like the New York Times is reporting some of that, isn't it? Or do you just feel it's not getting very little, yeah. very little, definitely not, you know, it is definitely not covering any of the to any extent that it should be. Mm. I'm trying to I think there was maybe one or two articles, one article about John Deere. Yeah, but it's not like they have somebody embedded there, like following this, covering it. It's very much told from the point of view of consumers who are now no longer going to be able to get, um, you know, the products that they want or toys for their kids for Christmas or whatever it is. Yeah. So, so to me, it's sort of like, okay, so the media is not covering the most important story, you know, of the decade, right? <laughs> Maybe not of the decade, but, um, yeah. but it's still happening. I mean, it's still right. So it's like, you know, yes, we need a free press. It's very important. The free press today is, a, you know, is, is failing the American people. We would be doing better if they were doing a better job, but I guess it, I just feel like the, the, uh, and industry is not going to save us from ourselves. Like we have to do that on our own. Just one final question, just on the history, because you, yeah. you, you explain how this professionalization of, um, of uh, American journalism happens. The history is quite different from the UK where journalists tend to say, to reject the term profession, they mm -hmm. can regard it as a trade. And it's always had a you know, slightly a, a grubbier yeah. reputation. That growth, which you describe of it being an elite occupation, where does that where does that come from? It, it you know, the roots of this are, um, are after the Second World War, aren't they? When essentially it's decided that you know, that, 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 that journalism needs to become much grander and take itself more seriously. So the New York Times always had a kind of tweetier, more retiring, more highly educated uh, reporter, but they were very much in the minority for much of the 20th century. I think it was less intentional and it had a lot more to do with um, certain pressures from within the industry. So, for example, um, it started with television. So in 1964, that was the first year that the majority of Americans said they get their news from TV. If you're getting your news from TV, you know, you're getting a very immediate visually audio version of what happened. So a newspaper has to give you something more than that. So newspapers started to shift towards being more interpretive and being less just descriptive, which meant you needed somebody who could write, right? Which, so that kind of put, started to put a premium on a college education. Then you had um, All the President's Men, a movie that suddenly made being a journalist seem like this very sexy and glamorous occupation. And that had a real shift. So you would have people who would work at the Harvard Crim Crimson, right? And then go on to become senators, right? presidents, you know, they would have these big, important jobs. Now, suddenly, a lot of people who worked at the Crimson were staying in the profession when they left Harvard and becoming journalists because it was very glamorous. And as those people started to become journalists, they started asking for more money. It started paying more, more 
highly educated people started coming, suddenly you didn't just need a college degree, you needed a much more, you know, highly educated, um, more elite college degree, you know, these things have kind of have a snowballing effect, but it was, it was really the collapse of the local news industry that that really was the fine, you know, the, the, the internet having that revolutionary effect, because essentially, at that point, to become a journalist, you had to really live in one of these elite city, you know, expensive cities, you had to have that elite education. And now it's just like, you know, there's, it's only going in one direction. Terrific. Well, thank you for joining us. Bad news, how woke media is undermining democracy by Batya Unger Sagan. Uh, really, really interesting discussion. We were meant to talk for half an hour and we talked for an hour because there was so much to discuss. Really, really enjoyed it. And uh, if you're not a subscriber to Reaction on YouTube, just hit the subscribe button. Also visit the site and you can get my weekly newsletter on politics. Until next time, thank you for listening and watching. Thank you so much for having me.